Well, sadly, as we've been expecting for some time, we see the global death rate continues to rise as we'd unfortunately anticipated. So, it's uh, Friday the 1st of May. Welcome to this global update. Now, I'm going to start off with something very uh, curious, interesting. Now, the American president has said he has seen evidence that coronavirus originated at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And at the same time, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the United States, who hopefully are intelligent, said the intelligence community also concurs with the wide scientific consensus that COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified. So what are we to make of these two apparently uh, conflicting statements, which I've recorded there? Well, actually, um, I don't think they do contradict, strangely enough. If the president says he's seen some evidence, then I, I think we have to assume he's seen some evidence. He could be lying through his teeth, but I don't see why he should. So he's seen some evidence, and yet the intelligence people are saying that the virus is not man-made. Now, to me, it's quite possible. It seems the evidence from the virologists and the biochemists and the clever people that understand these things, they say that it's not a synthesised virus, not a man-made virus in a laboratory. Now, of course, human beings can't make viruses. Human beings can't make uh, the simplest form of life. Now, we could argue whether a virus is a type of life or not, but the virus has got the, the, uh, the, nu the nuclear material, the DNA or the RNA. It's surrounded by protein. In the case of the COVID-19, it's surrounded by a, a, a phospholipid, uh, a fatty um, membrane round about the outside. So it's quite a complicated structure, so we can't make those. But what human beings can do is they can take existing viruses and they can take a bit of a virus that makes it very transmissible and they can take a bit of a virus that makes it very deadly and they can put the two together. So you can end up with a virus which is remarkably easy to catch, maybe something like uh, measles, it's very easy to catch, but very deadly, like, uh, say, Ebola or something like that. That's quite possible, and, and there's no question that such viruses uh, exist uh, to be used in the event of biological war warfare. So th th they do exist, and humans can jiggle around with viruses, but it looks like they haven't jiggled around with this one. What I think might have happened, now it, it is a heck of a coincidence that this whole global pandemic um, originated officially 14 miles away from this huge... Um, virology, Chinese Institute Virology Centre, 14 kilometres. It, it does seem a bit of a coincidence. Now, in China, there's quite a lot of corruption. So what could have happened is they could have been experimenting with some animals. Now, you can argue about animal research, but, but uh, it's understandable that they could use animal research to test uh, coronavirus physiology and maybe develop vaccines and all that sort of thing, because there's been coronavirus outbreaks before. Then what could have happened is one of the workers from this um, lab has actually sold some animals to the, to the, to the Wuhan wet market. That, that, that is possible because there doesn't seem to be an intermediate between, between bats and humans. People thought it was pangolins at first, but that doesn't seem to be bearing out. So it's quite possible that both are true. So I think a lot more to come on that rather interesting story. Now, this is also concerning the World Health Organization want to investigate the orig origins of the virus, as indeed does everyone. I mean, everyone's suffering from this terrible pandemic. Where did it come from? Well, we know it came from China, but how, why, what, where, when? And uh, the World Health Organization want to put together a team of experts to, to investigate that. But uh, China hasn't invited them in, which is quite frankly, nothing short of alarming. China want, seems to want to investigate this on its own. Now, I don't want to stray into politics, but it seems to me we need the world's best people on this. So I really do hope the Chinese government decide to let in a World Health Organization team. And I think we have to differentiate between the teams of world experts that the World Health Organization puts together and the management and previous performance of the World Health Organization. 
the World Health Organization has performed terribly in this in this crisis, in my view, in many ways. But yet they can still recruit the very best people in the world to have teams to go there and investigate things. So I really want to see that happening. But not yet. Hasn't happened yet. Now, lots of people ask me why their country is more affected than others. Why are some countries more affected than others by this virus? And a big part of that is the time that the virus arrived. So Italy, for example, um, the cases were identified on the 25th of February. But Portugal, it wasn't until the 20th of March, nearly a month later. So they, had, they had a month more time to get ready. So I really think it's that simple. I think it's the time that people had in warning. And, and in Italy as well, in the early days, people were preconceptual as to the the spread of this virus <clears throat> and the amount of measures it would take to contain it. So that's why it was done slowly. Whereas other countries like Portugal and Hungary had a greater head start and New Zealand had the biggest head start of all. That's why they've essentially been able to eradicate the virus. So I congratulate the people in New Zealand. They've done very well, but also they've been very fortunate in getting their uh, last, as it were. Now, the UK. Um, so this is this is UK here now. Um, what's going on in the UK? Um, well, the uh, the deaths are still increasing and we've got pretty horrendous death rates now in the UK. Now, I think I might have a, a graphic to illustrate uh, to illustrate this. A hoop. Yep. So. Confirmed total confirmed COVID-19 deaths and how rapidly they are increasing. Now, remember, this is the logarithmic scale we look at. And what we need to look at here is the, the rate of increase is the slope of the curve there. So in Spain, we see that that slope is virtually flattened off, as, as in Germany, maybe a little bit, if we extrapolated from that. Portugal, maybe the direction is the same. But of course, Portugal is much lower because they got the virus much later. So we see that the UK, and that's the, U, the UK line's not labelled there, but that's it there. Uh, what is it? Is it? No, I think it's that one there. That's the UK line there. And we see it's actually now currently above Spain. So the UK may actually overtake uh, Spain in terms of uh, in terms of uh, number of. UK may overtake Spain in terms of number of total number of deaths. And this is the number in the UK now, because in the UK now we're including nursing homes and people at home. So the death rate now is uh, 26, 27,000. And many people still think it's significantly higher than that. So that's the bad news. <clears throat> now, the good news is this Oxford trial group where they're making this vaccine. Now, we mentioned yesterday that this vaccine is well on because they were working on other coronavirus um, coronaviruses at this centre before the current pandemic. So they already had a background in, in coronavirus research, which was good. And they're now using several centres across the UK to test the efficacy of this. And they are making very optimistic noises. And they're co uh, collaborating with AstraZeneca. Now, um, I, I know some of you will have reservations about Big Pharma, as I do, but um, they are making quite a lot of promises that this is going to be distributed to the world. So let's hope that happens. And let's hope this virus is successful. Google Maps did report more people moving around in the UK last weekend. So um, people going to parks and things, which they're allowed to do, but there was a lot more of them um, than the weekend before. So people are getting a bit bored, understandably, I suppose, with this lockdown. But still, until we get the uh, testing and the the tracing and the isolation much better worked out. We still need this rather crude measure of the lockdown. Now, the United States, a bit of a global epicenter. We know there's over a million cases, 63,000 deaths. In New York alone, over 300,000 cases and over 23,000 deaths. And the concern, my concern remains that other cities might follow New York just with a delay. And, and I'll give you one reason why I'm concerned about that. The, the, the curve could be a similar shape to New York, just with a delay. And, and to, to illustrate that, I'll just talk briefly about Georgia uh, to lift a statewide shelter in place order for most residents starting tomorrow. That's uh, Saturday, isn't it? So, um, yeah. 
So they're, lif- they're lifting that. Brian Kemp has ordered those more vulnerable, the elderly and what he calls the medical fragile, to remain at home. Urge residents to stay at home as much as possible. So whether they do or not, we don't know. And one of my contacts from the States said, well, I went to Petco, which is a pet shop, this morning. Not one employee or customer had a mask on, nor were any efforts made to maintain social distancing. Now, this is just one person with one email, but if this is the case, then uh, we have guaranteed spread, I am afraid. I don't see any way, uh, any way around that. Now, um, Australia. Now, um, I've had a lot of, there's a lot of controversy on the feedback about this app or various apps ideas that we, we talk about. Now, um, <clears throat> this Australia app, someone's emailed me from Australia to clarify it. And they said it doesn't track your location or use any kind of geolocation. It uses Bluetooth to ping the phones of people around you who also have the app installed. So it's pinging. So in other words, it's a proximity checker with other with other phones that have the app installed already. Um, the the things that went in, I don't know what that means. <laughs> that went into encryption for a, oh yeah, sorry, it stores the information uh, with encryption for a rolling period of 21 days. That's right, sorry. So it stores it for 21 days and, and then the information is deleted because that allows for the incubation period of the virus. So it stores where you've been for 21 days or stores the pings, your contacts, stores your contacts for 21 days. After 21 days, it's erased. Uh, personal information is encrypted by the phone and a unique identification is generated and tied to that user. So in other words, uh, people won't be able to hack into it. I'm sure the Australian government's more than capable of making a secure system. Then if someone develops symptoms or tests, that the positives are known because the, the phones have pinged with each other, have contacted each other. So it's really a proximity checker. And then the contacts can be informed that they've been near someone who's had COVID-19 and then they can self-isolate themselves for 14 days. So that's the way that's uh, that's working in Australia, apparently, which is, it sounds quite reasonable to me, I must say. Now, Germany is the European experiment, as we mentioned yesterday. Now, they are having a limited reopening at the moment. Now, they had last Sunday uh, an extra 1,300 cases. Then they had 988 extra cases on Monday the 27th when the lockdown was eased. Now they've got an extra 1,200 cases. Sorry, Tuesday an extra 1,200 cases. Wednesday, 1,600. Thursday, 1,400. Friday, over 1,600. So it does look like the cases in Germany are starting to go up again from uh, day to day. Now, the Germans, of course, are watching this carefully. And what the plan seems to be is to titrate the degree of freedom they give people with the amount of increase in cases. So if the amount of cases increase too much, they might need to restrict freedoms again. And it looks like they're trying to balance it out. So this means the virus will slowly spread through the population. But at the same time, economic activity will be um, facilitated. Will this mean that more people will catch the virus? Yes. Will it more pe- mean more people become seriously ill? Yes, it will. Will it mean more people will die? Yes, it will. Is it possible to keep a country locked down until we get a vaccine? I don't think it is. So I make no comment on the rightness or wrongness. I just see that is what Germany seems to be doing. Now, Singapore has had a bit of a resurgence, unfortunately. Having done very well in the initial stages, it's actually had another 932 cases yesterday, mostly among migrant workers, and they live in dormitory complexes. So this is the problem. So what they're doing is they're spreading them out. Apparently, there's a couple of cruise ships in Singapore <clears throat> sitting there doing nothing. So they're moving migrant workers into the cruise ship so they can spread them out. And as we looked at yesterday, living in dormitories is a major risk. In fact, there's guaranteed spread, isn't there, if people live in dormitories? Just five new cases in Singapore nationals, only 15 deaths. So that gives a remarkably low death rate in Singapore. I haven't worked that out, but uh, you can see it's going to be a remarkably low death rate. I'm not quite sure how to explain that at the moment. Now, South Africa (coughs) went into dramatic and uh, serious lockdown. Um, 
10 days after the first case. And the early lockdown worked. It was ferociously enforced. Uh, but now the lockdown is easing. Uh, infections will now increase. So it's starting to ease the lockdown. Therefore, infections will start to increase. Um, concerning because, for example, in townships, they share toilets and things like that. And we know toilets are a big risk factor. And South Africa generally is weakened by uh, corruption. Not to put too fine a point on it. So how will the health services cope? With great difficulty, if at all, is the answer. So the lockdown in South Africa has caused massive uh, difficulty to people. And um, it's now being eased. So there will be more cases and I'm fearful that it will spread. So it may be that all that's happened in South Africa is it's been delayed. That's good, but that may be all that's happened. So I remain concerned. And India, in, in a strange way, is a similar kind of story. Now, India's been locked down for six weeks. It's caused massive difficulties. People are hungry in many places. Stringent controls, checkpoints around the country. Spread has been greatly slowed down. But now they're starting to going to start to ease the lockdown soon. So there will be more cases. And I fear, again, all that's happened in India is it's been slowed down. I hope I'm wrong. I hope they've got on top of it. But um, I'm afraid it's just been slowed down and the testing is still very poor. In Delhi, for example, we know there's red zones where people aren't allowed in and out. So we know the cases are there. We know the spread there. And uh, it will start spreading that there's guaranteed to be more cases and we know as in south africa many people have difficulty accessing health care so the case fatality rate will be sadly high now france i'm um, not going to go into detail today but we've done it many times but france is is repairing its bikes and making temporary uh, bicycle parking spaces push bikes pedal cycles whatever you call them and the aim is to get people back on their push bikes to reduce overcrowding in metros and buses. Now, this makes perfect sense. So most people have got a bike in their shed somewhere, <laughs> uh, might have a flat tire or need a new chain. So they're giving grants of uh, 50 euros to people to do the bikes up so they can be more cycling to reduce overcrowding. Because public transport, of course, is a great way for the virus to spread. And France is keen to get back to work. So cycling is a really good way because it's outside. You know, we need to do much more outside. We need much more ventilation, as we've said repeatedly. Uh, employers to cover up to 400 euros of travel costs for staff who cycle to work. So that's great. And the authorities say cycling can contribute to preventing a second wave of the coronavirus pandemic. So if people can cycle to work and that halves the amount of people on public transport, that's going to dramatically reduce the national R0 figure and hopefully keep it well under one. And also planning to create new bike lanes by taking spaces away from car lanes. Now, I'm a cyclist, so I think this is brilliant. <laughs> I think this is fantastic. But it's a really, really good idea. Get more people outside. And they're also going to encourage electric uh, bicycles as well as pedal bicycles for those that are less fit, which is fair enough. But the point is people will be on individual transport. They'll be outside in the fresh air. And uh, they won't be crammed into uh, metros breathing in each other's coronaviruses. Now, Russia, I think I'll, I'll just show this graphic now on Russia. Um, right, Russia's a major concern. So Taiwan there has done superbly. No new cases, it's, uh, no new deaths rather. It's flat, this is deaths. Russia is going up steeply. And you can see the angle there. So extrapolating up, I think in Russia... The doubling time of the deaths there is going to be about seven or eight days. And uh, that looks like it's happening in Russia at the moment. So that is really uh, very concerning in the, in the Russian situation. We'll come on to testing later. Um, yeah, very concerning. Um, so record daily rise again. Uh, so Thursday, there was an extra 7,099 cases. Friday, nearly another 8,000 cases on Friday. Now well over 100,000 official cases. And deaths continue to rise. 
that figure's wrong. I'm not sure what that is. Sorry, that's wrong. So there, there was there was 93 extra deaths. I'm not sure what the total deaths are. We could have seen it from that graph. Uh, so 93 deaths Friday, 101 extra deaths on Thursday. So the total definitely increasing. Oh, this is this is agreeing doubling about every seven. We said eight every seven or eight days, and that's about every eight days. Uh, Vladimir has said they're not yet at a peak. In other words, the cases are still going up. People restricted to their homes, causing great difficulty. And um, that's been extended to the 11th of May. Now, let's just look at this testing thing here, because testing is the way out of this. So the big hope for Russia is that they do seem to be testing quite a lot. So that's the Russia test there. So they're actually testing more tests per thousand people than the United States. So let's hope that reduces my pessimistic outlook for Russia. I really hope so because the health facilities in Russia aren't good to cope with a lot of people. Uh, that's Australia. Australia's done well. The United States is catching up. United Kingdom is catching up. We're up to, we're up, we are up to 100,000 a day now, so that should be going up as well. South Africa, way down there. Bangladesh, no need to comment. Um, it's, uh, we've talked about the poorer countries of the world many times and they're going to be really quite severe problems. Now, just before we um, leave that, this is Daniel from uh, Taiwan, who's kindly sent me some pictures of him because we've just looked at how good Taiwan is. Now, this is a picture of his local market with people wearing masks. Now, he calls this a wet market, but I don't see any live animals there. So that's encouraging. So it looks like these so-called wet markets aren't as appalling as the wet markets in China. Although there's probably bigger ones than that. I'd, I'd probably call that more of a fishmonger's. Um, this is people in the streets, mostly wearing masks. This lady's not. This is Taiwan uh, in the last day or two. So um, even though um, no new cases there, people are still observing precautions. There in a baker's, everyone wearing masks, which is good to see. And again, masks and a degree of social distancing, although this could be better, of course. Because, sorry, that's Liz's graphic. We'll show that another time. Now, uh, Mike, Mike has sent this in. Um, he's just tidied this up for us. So um, this is this is a carrier without a mask. And even if the person's wearing a mask there, they can still catch it. So the, the main reason is this is the carrier here. The main reason is that the person carrying it, he's got 5% there. You won't be able to see that. But the main reason the person carry it doesn't infect other people. So the main reason to wear a mask is to stop you infecting other people. And if both are wearing a mask, it goes down a little bit more. So the reason to wear masks is the infected person protects the non-infected person. If a person's infected and not wearing a mask, then even if you wear a mask, you're still quite likely to catch it. I don't know what the figures are, but that, that's kind of the moral of, the, of that story. Um, now, that was uh, that was Russia. Now Brazil, the last country I want to report on today. Uh, Brazil, um, increasing deaths. Hospitals are already overwhelmed. Apparently, a long way to the peak. They're not there yet, and the disease seems to have a stigma in Brazil, which is. I can't really understand that. It seems to be seen as shameful. Um, it's not It's not people of Brazil. It's not shameful. It's just a disease. You just get it or you don't. You know, it's, there's no stigma to it. I mean, you can understand stigmas with perhaps sexually transmitted diseases. I mean, I'm not making any judgments. There's no, there's no need for stigma, but, but um, you can understand it. But, but with... A respiratory acquired disease, why on earth should there be a stigma? Anyway, limited testing. Distressing scenes from Sao Paulo digging 13,000 graves with automatic diggers. Bodies going in individual graves, but almost like a mass burial in Sao Paulo. So very pessimistic about the situation in, in Brazil. And the, the, let's just say that President Baltazaro hasn't been exactly proactive. He thought it was a bit like a sniffle or a minor flu or something. It's been, yeah, not a good reaction. Now, um, just, just a sort of general interest story here, really. 
Um, this is a pack of PPE. Now, I can't read it, it's Chinese, but there's masks and gowns and all sorts of stuff. Now, what this is, um, th this is actually from... Um, yeah, I'm a Chinese resident in the UK. Uh, this, this is... Uh, I won't be able to pronounce this right. Gamisio. Apologies, I've just completely butchered your name, Gamisio. So, Chinese resident in the UK. Um, uh, a couple of days ago, I was contacted by the Chinese government and they told me they are sending me a pack of PPEs and some health supplements all ch for all Chinese citizens abroad. So every Chinese citizen li living abroad is receiving this pack with these various uh, goodies in it of various PPEs and health promoting things. I wonder if there's some vitamin D in there or something. I don't, I don't know. He doesn't say what's in the pack. Um, they advised us that we would have to wear full PPE on the aeroplane and at the airport if we do decide to fly back to China. So if they want to go back to China, they've got to wear all this PPE. We would also have to register our symptoms online using a mobile phone app for 14 consecutive days before being permitted to enter China. So the app is absolutely compulsory there in China. Uh, I'm aware that before we were permitted to collect our luggage, we would have to go through a uh, test, uh, um, an antigen test for the virus, health screening, after we've collected the luggage, we will be escorted to a designated hotel in our local area to be quarantined for a further 14 days. So they have to have their health. They have to report on this app for 14 days to say they're asymptomatic. They fly with all this kit on uh, and all this kit at the airport. And then they're escorted to a local hotel near where they live and uh, quarantined for another 14 days. Now, I have actually been in contact with some people who went through a similar process in China and they just stayed at a local hotel and it was fine. They were actually quite well looked after and they were well fed and they didn't have to pay. So it was actually very satisfactory. Uh, before they are released, they would have to be tested for both antigen and antibody for confirmation that we have not contacted the virus. Oh, here, here we are. The pack contains 10 surgical masks, two N95 masks, five pairs of surgical gloves, one full body hood, less quarantine suit, one goggles. <laughs> and he says, I wonder if you're interested in commenting, commenting on the measures and would they be effective in aeroplanes? Uh, that's a good question. If you are sitting next to someone who is infected all the way to China, I don't know how long, a 10 hour flight or something in an aeroplane, then um, yeah, I suspect there'd still be a risk to be quite honest. But that the Chinese authorities are taking extreme precautions to prevent backflow there just a pity they didn't take such extreme precautions to prevent this outbreak in the first place when it was still a tiny cluster in Wuhan when it could have been completely stopped great failure but since then the Chinese have done uh, very uh, dramatic things to try and curtail the pandemic in their own country and uh, it's just been a little late for everyone else that's the problem so anyway, I was interested to see that. Now, that's us for today. So let's just look at a few uh, of my viewers. This is and uh, Aga and Magda in, uh, not quite sure where they are. Poland, you're in Poland. Oh, right, okay, okay. I've, I'm pronouncing your names wrong. I do apologize, I, I'm actually a bit dyslexic especially when it comes to names, and I just um, I have difficulty with names. <laughs> anyway, nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Is that a real cat or a pretend one? I think it's a pretend one. <laughs> oh, nice looking breakfast there. That Barbara's about to eat in Canada, but Barbara was camera shy, but she assures me she does watch over breakfast every day, so thank you, Barbara. Very nice looking breakfast. This is Kareen in California. Um, yeah, glad to see you trust Dr. Fauci. Won't comment too much on that. Excellent. But thank you for watching. <laughs> I must look really big on these screens. Christina in Washington State. Oh, making masks. Well done, Christina. Masks are going to stop you spreading your viruses to other people. And hopefully if you give those out to other people, they won't spread their viruses to you. Excellent work. 
Craig in the northeast of England. Sunderland, I think Craig might be in. Good to know you're watching over there in the northeast, Craig. Hope you're keeping warm. Greg in Dubai. Huge screen TVs. I must be behind the times. <laughs> so good to know you're watching in Dubai, Greg. Thank you. Seems strange to see me in Dubai, but there you go. <laughs> Great. Amazing. Who was that? Uh, Janny in South Africa. Don't know why you're in the corner of the screen there, but uh, you glad you're watching anyway. Thank you. Ah, oh, this is uh, Jarley, and I don't know what his wife's called, but the daughter took this out the window, apparently. Um, they're watching, you probably can't see, but they're watching on the phone there. So I am on that phone, trust me. Yeah, I am on that phone. <laughs> uh, this is Jen. Uh, Illinois, Illinois, I think Jen's. I think Jen's in Illinois. Yeah, I think we saw you yesterday, Jen, as well. I think you've slipped in twice, but you're welcome twice. <laughs> Kira in Suffolk, in England. Oh, good. Lots of people watch with cats and dogs. That's good. Who is this? Kurt in Cambridge. Now, Kurt's managed to turn his photo inside out, unless I have done Kurt. I'm sorry if it's the wrong way around, but... Um, I'm glad to see you're taking vitamin D in Cambridge because in England we do not get enough sun. And of course, Kurt will make vitamin D more slowly than I will. So taking vitamin D supplements seems to be a good idea. I'm currently taking 50 micrograms of vitamin D a day. And I imagine Kurt's probably taking something similar. I believe that will reduce not so much your chances of getting the infection Kurt but I believe it will reduce your chances of getting severe disease so I'm really delighted you are following that advice Kurt well done uh, Lerand in Sweden good good to you're watching is Sweden beautiful country Sweden and Norway Oh, someone else having breakfast. I must make people feel hungry. <laughs> this is Lynette and Paul who we who watch over breakfast as well. Quite a nice looking breakfast as well. Must be feeling hungry now. <laughs> uh, uh, this is uh, Marek in Scarborough. And you are right, my friend. We need to move from reactivity to proactivity. At least we did many weeks ago. I guess we still do, but... Ah! This is, this is uh, Maria in Sweden. Uh, thank you for making computer... Well, I don't know about that. I think computer engineering is good. Now, Maria in Sweden, um, <laughs> this is not a setup, but she's bought my books. So that, that, that's Campbell's Physiology Notes. So that's my, my work on... Uh, my, my book on physiology. And that's Campbell's Pathophysiology Notes. That's all on pathophysiology. So physiology is the study of the normal function of the body. And pathophysiology is the study of the abnormal function of the body. And uh, because pathology is bad news, that book's black for disease and death and horrible things like that. And physiology is good, so that's white for youth and virginity or something. Anyway, that's what that's what they are. The black the black the, the black book is for disease and the white book is for normal. <laughs> physiology and pathophysiology. Okay. You can download those on PDFs as well. Probably easier. Oh, Maria in the US. Looking very uh, contemplative, uh, Maria. But the main thing is you've invited me in. Is that vitamin D you've got there? I think it might be. Good. So, Maria, thank you for sending that picture in. Delighted you are watching. <laughs> 